Last week we started uh, a new mini series in our trip through uh, Exodus as we are looking at the concept of uh, deliverance, how God wants to deliver us. There's really three main sections to the book of Exodus, and the first section is simply the, the Exodus, the uh, the people of God being set free and coming out of uh, slavery and oppression in Egypt. And then the second section is the giving of the law. And, and now the third section is the description of the tabernacle. Now this is very interesting. It is just a tent in the desert. But right off the bat, you know there's something very amazing here uh, because God took two chapters to describe the creation of the entire universe but he takes 50 chapters to describe the tabernacle, the, the tent in the desert. Now, last week, as we went through that three-dimensional panorama, we saw three main points. The first one is it reveals something about God, the revelation of deity, and it shows the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and, and some very powerful truths. The second was the description of humanity. That is, God is showing something, describing something about you and me. And remember, I said we are a tent made of three rooms. And we have the physical part of us. We have the emotional and the intellectual part of us. But we also have the spiritual part of us, which is the eternal element of our humanity. Then on, in the third point, we talked about how the tent is really an invitation to unity with God. So for since the fall of man, from the beginning of Genesis, man has had problems with God. Man and deity has been at odds. And so if you look at the, uh, the population of the world today, you will see that people are trying to pacify God by doing this and doing that or, or denying that there is a God and, and wrestling with all these, these different concepts. But God is, way back thousands of years ago, inviting His creation, humanity, into unity with Him. God wants to unify with man, but it has to be on God's terms. We can't come to God on our own terms and say, God, this is who I am You've got to accept me this way. We have to come to God. He's the creator, the designer, the engineer, and say, God, I agree with you. That is really what it's all about. And the tent is a shadowy illustration of what will be revealed fully one day in glory and in time to come when Jesus the Messiah will show up there in Israel and eventually come to Jerusalem and die on the cross and rise again the third day for all of humanity. So last week we looked at Exodus 25 and verse number 8 with the theme, Make Me a Sanctuary. And here it is, And let them make me a sanctuary. A sanctuary is a special set-aside spot that I may dwell among them. And that's what we really brought out. God wants to be with you. You don't have to feel isolated. You don't have to feel like God's a million miles away. You don't know what God's doing. No, God wants to dwell with you. Now, in our day and age, God, the sanctuary is the heart of man. God says, make me a, a sanctuary in your life. And and make me significant, make me special, make me the only one in your heart and in your life. In verse number 40 last week, which is the last verse of chapter 25, it says that the people are supposed to follow a pattern. And look thou that thou make them after their what? Their pattern which was showed thee in the mount. So that Mount Sinai, God says, I want this pattern to be carefully, carefully followed. So today we enter into our second in the series, Tabernacle Part Number 2. And this is the Ark of the Covenant. And we're going to follow Scripture. Now, many times uh, when we describe the, um, uh, the tabernacle, we'll start outside 
and will describe the the silver chapters in the and the uh, the white uh, the curtain and then we'll come in in the brazen altar and and kind of progressively and climax there with the Ark of the Covenant. But Scripture doesn't reveal it that way at all. It, God starts with His presence. God starts with the Ark of the Covenant. And by definition, we've got to describe our terms. An Ark doesn't mean a boat like Noah's Ark. But actually... Noah's ark was a box of security. That's what an ark is. It's like a safety deposit box. And so Noah was called into the ark. Noah, come thou and thy family and all these different creatures into the ark. And it was a place of safety and security, which is our subject for today. It, by definition, is a, a box, a chest, a place of safety. Now, you remember baby Moses. Bose, baby Moses was put in an ark made of, of bulrushes and put in, the, put in the river. It was an ark of safety to preserve him from the, uh, the genocide that was happening there in Egypt. So it's a tent, but it's more than a tent. And it's a tent because the people lived in tents. And so there was many nomadic peoples back in that day. And they would put the leader, they would put the king in the central tent. And God is simply saying, I'm your leader. I'm your king. Not Moses. Moses wasn't in the central tent. God was in the central tent. And God wants to be in the central tent of our lives. Now, since the fall of man, God has been calling unto his creation you remember there in the garden, after Adam and Eve had, had uh, fallen into sin, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. And God called out to Adam, 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 where art thou? And God was calling his creation into his presence. After God heard the, uh, the terrible um, results of their sin and, and God knew but God asks his people to fess up and God asks us to fess up God knows God dwells in the light and there is no hiding anything from God but he does ask us to confess and get right Adam after that Adam built an altar and you remember Cain and Abel built an altar and Cain brought one thing and Abel brought another and that was the result of the first major conflict and the first murder uh, Noah, when he was called into the ark of safety, and as he came out, um, he built uh, an altar unto the Lord. And, and so this is a little bit different. God is no longer um, going to be meeting people at a, an altar, but God is saying, I am going to dwell with you. That's what this is saying. This is saying, God is saying to his people, I want to be with you but you've got to set aside a special place and you've got to meet me on my terms and that's where the struggle is today and and people are getting really good now listen up people are getting really good at describing their own terms where god can meet them and it will never work this is what I agree with. This is how I feel. This is how I identify. This is how we have organized ourselves. And God is saying, what are you even talking about? I'm the creator. I did the designing. And now our study, the Ark of the Covenant. What does covenant mean? It means contract. Or actually, in the text, it means testimony. So I'd like to, we've got a little video here, and I'd like to read Exodus 25, verses 10 through verse number 22. Now, if this is um, distractive to you, don't get distracted. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't get distracted here. Uh, maybe the words and the description from the text is, is all you need. Maybe some of you, how many of you are kind of visual learners? Would you raise your hand? A few. And, and, and maybe this is going to help. But either way, uh, don't choke on the bones. Eat the meat, spit out the bones, okay? Exodus 25 and verse number 10. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. 
two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without. And thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves or poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half uh, shall it be, and the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. Thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end, and, on the, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And verse 22. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. And between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony. And of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now, there's many people that have studied this. And there's been... Um, different movies made. Matter of fact, there's five movies in the series, Raiders of the Lost Ark, speaking of the Ark of the Covenant, and uh, some fictitious story about how Hitler, back in the 30s, wanted the presence of God, the symbol of God, to make his army invincible. And, um, and somehow God was in the box. And God, if you had God in a box that you could do anything you wanted to do, and you were unstoppable. Actually, that's exactly opposite of what God said. God never said he was in a box. And we're foolish to think that we can control God. Look at verse number 22. And guys, if you could bring that up here. This is what it says. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. We're not going to get to the mercy seat this week. We're going to study the mercy seat next week. But God says, I'm not in the box. I'm above it. The mercy seat is the, is the lid of this box. It fits on top. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. He says, I'm going to talk with you. I'm going to meet with you. And it, I'm not living in this little box. Don't think that. That's not what God said. God says, a place of meeting. It's all about security. You know, each of us wrestle and deal with fears. And sometimes we think, oh, other people don't have fears. Only I have fears. Now, a phobia is a fear that's baseless, a baseless fear. But fear is real. And very successful people have fears. Men, women, boys, girls, little kids. They say that little babies, the two most natural fears and the uh, initial fears that all humanity has, number one is the fear of being left alone, being abandoned, being deserted. And the second is the fear of falling. And those two fears are in the smallest of little babies. 
the Lord blessed Deborah and I with seven children. Well, actually, I say only seven. We only got seven. But um, we saw those two fears in all of our kids. Nobody wanted to be left alone. Um, if I was putting on my shoes or grabbing a, a raincoat, it was never a winter coat, but a raincoat because we were living in New Guinea. And uh, uh, four of our kids were born there in New Guinea. The kids would gather around, where are we going? Don't leave me. I want to come. I want to go with you. That's, that's a desire. Now, you were made for God in the presence of God. And so there is a genuine fear that we will be abandoned and left behind by God. That we will fall from this position that we have. And so we're constantly in this desperation. And so this brand new people that were enslaved and abused and abused have come and have, have left Egypt. They've come out of Egypt and God says, I will dwell with you. I will be central. I'm not on the outskirts. I'm not just going to come visit you. I'm right in your midst. I want to be with you. And to start off this whole relationship, there will be an ark of promise or an ark of security or a chest or a box of covenant, of testimony, of promise. And that's what it's all about. And upon that chest is a mercy seat. And we'll, we'll deal with that next week. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't miss next week. Next week, you can't miss it, okay? <laughs> so I, I want to give you two points tonight. One is the autonomy of the ark. And secondly, the testimony of the ark. The autonomy and the testimony of the ark. That is, what is the ark constructed of and what is the contents of the ark? Well, back to verse number 10. We're in Exodus chapter no, number what? 25. You guys are awesome. Everybody alive, awake, awake, enthusiastic. Here we go. Verse number 10, it says, And thou shalt make an ark of acacia wood, of shittim wood. That is acacia wood. And then the very dimensions of it. This wood speaks of Messiah's humanity. Messiah's humanity. And God is going to reveal. God is going to bring the Savior. God is going to bring the Messiah or, or Christ. The word Messiah comes from Hebrew. The word Christ comes from Greek. And it's all speaking of our, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm chapter 1, in verse number 3, the Bible says, And he shall be like a tree. Interesting. Planted by rivers of water, it bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Humanity is like wood. It's like a tree. You remember Jesus when he healed that one, uh, that one man. He was blind, and Jesus anointed his eyes, and, and he said, What do you see? And he said, I see men as what? as trees walking. And Jesus said, okay, let's take another step. What do you see? And he says, I see everything, everybody clearly as they are. In Isaiah 53, in verse number one, it says, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That is, the Messiah is like a root. It's like a tree. It's like a root. There's something very earthy about humanity, and Jesus was born, and he looked like a common man. He wasn't like some handsome man or some super strong man or somebody you would necessarily pick out of a crowd. He's just a common man. But look at verse number 11. And thou shalt overlay it with what? Pure gold. Well, this is uncommon. By the way, acacia wood is a common desert plant. It is nearly indestructible. Uh, bugs and insects will not eat it. And uh, it does very, very well resisting water and weather and all that. 
But now it is to be wrapped in pure gold. And this is speaking about Messiah's divinity, his deity. See, he's God and man. Verse number 11 continues, and, it shall, and thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. This is speaking about the, the sovereignty or maybe the royalty of Messiah. So he's human, but he's God, and he's governor. He's the king. He's in charge. He's royalty. Now, verse number 12 brings out these four rings. And numbers in the Bible have very specific meanings. Now, sometimes people take them too far and, and get all mystical and weird, and, and that's not good. But more common, especially with us in our age in Western society, we don't take them far enough. We're like, there's lots of numbers. Look at the national debt. You see how many numbers there are in that? And we don't take them far enough. There is, there is significance to these numbers. Notice that there's four rings. And this deals with the, the universality of, of, of the Messiah. He is for everyone. Now, in the Bible, the number one has to do with, with uh, unity. Number one is unity. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Yeah. Number two is the number of witness. The Bible says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything, every word, be established. Number three is the number for divinity, God. In Genesis 2, the Bible records, let us make man in our image. In Genesis chapter 11, let us go down and there confound their language. In 1 John, it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. In John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The number four, and that's what we're trying to get to, the number four is the number of earth. The number of earth. The Bible speaks of four angels that are on the four corners of the sphere of the earth. It, the Bible speaks of four winds, four directions, four seasons. Yeah, north, south, east, west, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And so this speaks to the four rings that God is for every one. Now, in verses 13 and 14, it brings out the element of these rods or staves or, or poles. And this is uh, showing a shadow, uh, projecting an image of the availability of the Messiah. He's available to all. And wherever the people went, they were never to touch the ark, but they were to take that ark with them. And he's available. Proverbs 18 speaks about God, the Messiah, as a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I've heard many people talk about a friend that sticketh closer than a brother as their best friend. Oh, my best friend. They're, oh, they're so close. They're better than my brother. And that probably is good. But your brother used to beat you up, so it, it doesn't take much. Really what it's talking about is God. It's talking about uh, Christ being uh, willing to meet with us and to be very, very close. In verse number 15, everybody tracking with me here? Verse 15, it says, The staves, or the poles, shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall what? Not be taken from it. And this is speaking of the consistency of the ark, that is, of the Messiah. Yes, he's available, but he doesn't change. We live in a volatile society that's changing every, every which way, that uses people and discards them. And if you're not careful, you will be used and discarded, and you will say it's not fair. But it's not because you're following God or leaning into Christ. You've been distracted by somebody 
and putting your hope and trust in somebody. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ, our Messiah, is everything he claims to be and so much more. And you are not a fool to trust in him. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him. He's all that he claims to be. So I gave you six different things. Hopefully you got them. The first one I said, the Messiah's, oh, come on, help me out. The Messiah's humanity. Thank you, guys. Look at these guys. Let's give these guys a quick hand. Come on. Yeah. The guys are giving themselves a hand, too. All right, well, humanity. And then I said not only the Messiah's humanity, but the gold speaks of his divinity. And the crown speaks of sovereignty or royalty. Good. And... um. The four rings and the four corners, the universality of Christ, and then um, the, the rods or the poles is Messiah's availability, and then they're never to be removed. It is his stability or consistency. He is consistent, and you don't take them out. So that's the autonomy of the ark or the construction of the ark. Now we're going to go into the testimony of the ark, which is actually the the focus. We kind of just danced around the outside there for just a minute, but the focus of the whole thing, the box. What is the purpose of this box? It is to hold a testimony. It is a safety deposit box, and it doesn't hold God. It holds the covenant, or the testimony, or the contract between God and his people. In verse number 16, it speaks of this place of safe ke- keeping. An ark is a, can be a boat for Noah. It can be a box. It can be a chest. It's a sanctuary. It's a specific place for a specific thing. Noah had an, an ark, uh, a place of safety of gopher wood. Moses was of bulrushes. But God here is acacia wood and gold and this contract between God and man. Now, what is the testimony that's in? Now, right here in this text, it doesn't say. It just says the testimony that I'm going to give. So let me advance you forward to Hebrews 9 and verse number 4 and jot that down in your notes. Hebrews 9 and verse 4. And it's speaking of the holy of holies, the holy place and the holy of holies that had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. So the Ark of the Covenant, wherein was, and there's three things, the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Those are the three things, and that is the message for today. So I want you to get it. Elbow your neighbor. Make sure they're not sleeping. This is the message. So number one, the golden pot of manna. This simply speaks to the fact that God or the Messiah would satisfy his people with his resources. Now, think of it. We're going to a picnic here in a little while. There's resources. People have loaded up. They've uh, organized. Everybody's brought these different things, and we're going to go gather out there. What did God's people gather? Well, they gathered a little bit. But if you know the story, they've got to be out there for 40 years. What in the world? How are they going to survive? This is thousands, tens of hundreds of millions of people out there. We estimate three to five million people. And this golden pot of manna, it is uh, symbolic of the provision of God. Or if you want to write the word down, his resources. He would satisfy. And I want to say to you that God will satisfy you. God will take care of you. His resources are sufficient for whatever God has called you to do. Now, the manna was small. Speaking of just enough, and God uses small things. It was round in the shape of coriander seed, eternally complete. And it came down from heaven. Speaking of heaven-sent bread. That would be a great name for a company, heaven-sent bread. But it would never measure up. It would never, so it's not that good of a name. And then the people had to go out and pick it up off the ground. 
This speaks of the resurrection of the Messiah. Up from the grave, he arose. And it was placed in that golden pot, preserved forever. So God will provide. I want to tell you today, as a Christian, if you meet God on his terms, he will provide for you. You don't need to fear that God won't come through. He will come through. He will provide for you. He will satisfy with his resources. Now, the second thing uh, comes from Numbers chapter 17. And this is the conflict. It comes another couple books away in several chapters uh, between a power struggle between the people of God. So Aaron was the high priest, and God selected and chose him. But of course, the leaders of the 12 different tribes rose up and said, what about me? I'm the leader of, of, of my tribe. We're the chosen people. God's only chosen him and not me. Well, they didn't necessarily have an election. They didn't trust the outcome of the election. So <coughs> I just made that up. Uh, <coughs> so what they did is everybody went out and they cut a, uh, a stick. They just cut a old dead wooden stick and they brought it in and they brought it into the holy place and they said okay god you show us who's the leader and here's these rods and a rod is a symbol of power remember moses before pharaoh and and uh, aaron had a rod too and lord you show us who you've chosen and they wrote their names in the side of all these sticks and they they put them out there and the next day, they came back in, and Aaron's rod had three things happen to it. First, it budded. It had buds coming up. And then second, it had flowers. And third, it had almonds. It was an almond branch. And generally, if something is going to grow, it'll, it'll grow buds, and those buds will turn into the flowers, and those flowers will turn into the fruit, the almonds or whatever. But all three happened overnight. It was a supernatural thing. It wasn't, you know, he dipped it in honey in the secret. No, it was, it was God did a miracle to show who was in charge and who God had selected. And it was Aaron. And he was the priest, uh, that mediator there, until the Messiah came. Now, I'm not a priest. I'm a pastor. A priest is a mediator between God and man. And so when the Messiah came... The office of priest was not necessarily eliminated. It was fulfilled. It was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. All the priests beforehand were sinful men. Now, I'm sure that they were sincere and, and they did good. And there was a few bad apples and all that sort of stuff. But uh, when Jesus came, he fulfilled that office to perfection and so we don't need a mediator between God and man. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all I do is I stand up and proclaim the word of God and live it out. And, and we step forward and, and we go forward in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a picture, and write this down. We said the pot of manna would satisfy with his resources. The Messiah satisfies with resource. But here... The rod, God would uh, sanctify them with his resurrection. You see, this old de dead stick came back to life. And remember, we were in Isaiah chapter uh, 53 earlier, and it says, And he shall go up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground, a dead stick, a dry root. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It's the old dead root. It looks like it has no life at all. But now jump down to verse number 8. Speaking of the Messiah, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? What do you mean his generation? What? Why? For he was what? Cut off, just like Aaron's rod was cut off. The Messiah was cut off. Remember, everything is pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to the Messiah. He was cut off out of the land of the living. He was killed for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? It wasn't his 
sin that nailed him to the cross. It was mine. It was yours. And he was as good as dead. But the story's not den- done. Jump down to verse number 10. Verse number 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God said it was good that the Messiah should suffer and die in order to save me and you. That's an amazing thought. Never get over that. Never get over that. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. The almonds came back. And the spiritual seed of the work of Christ is you and me. He shall prolong his days. He was dead. He was cut off. But he's prolonged. He rose again. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It pleased the Lord. And he died. And now the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. It's talking about the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? If it's not amazing, you didn't quite see it. You maybe need to wrestle with it just a little bit more. You see, it's about resources, the pot of manna, and it's about the resurrection and who's in charge. And the Lord Jesus Christ is in charge. Say, who's in charge of this church? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm not the good shepherd. I'm the under shepherd. And I'm only good as I'm submitted to the word of God and following what God says. My word doesn't have any more weight than your word unless it lines up with the very word of God. And so I will give account as I lead the church under Christ. And if I lead astray, which is the example of tens of thousands of other churches that started well, started with the Word of God, uh, started by submitting and meeting God where God said to meet Him. There at the ark, there with the testimony, there with what He said, and then eventually straying. And we said this, and we said that, and we said the other thing. And God says, I, I'm not just going to meet you wherever. I'm going to meet you here. Now, I'm a Christian. How many of you are Christians? You raise your hand. Yeah. And I meet with God, and, and God speaks to me. But I'll tell you this. There's been, been many times where I have felt very alone and cut off from God. And the voice of God feels, well, I don't even know where it went. And that's not because I'm meeting with God It's because I'm asking God to meet with me somewhere else. And God says, come meet with me. Now, that's not talking about we have to all go to Jerusalem, make some great pilgrimage. It's talking about meeting him at the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, the contract of God, what God said and what he meant. Now, the third thing. So the first is the pot of manna, speaking of his resource. The second is Aaron's rod that budded, speaking of the resurrection. And the third thing is the Ten Commandments. We just did ten weeks of the Ten Commandments. And that is that the Messiah would justify him, them, through his righteousness. Resources, resurrection, and righteousness. Go ahead and say that with me. Resources, resurrection, and and righteousness. God is saying, I want to meet with you. I want to bring you new life, and I want to make you righteous, but you've got to meet with me in that perfect space. Now, Christ kept the law perfectly, and he is our righteousness. One of the most beautiful verses in the Bible that present the gospel so very clearly, for he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to become sin for us, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Speaking of God, allowed Jesus to become sin so that we could become righteousness. In other words, God took the account of Jesus, perfect, righteous, and switched it with mine, and I got to give mine to Jesus. Mine was sin, and all those Ten Commandments, liar, 
thief, lust, lazy, uh, all these other things, horrible things. And I gave it to God, Jesus. And Jesus took perfection, the Son of God, holy, clean, everything perfect. And he gave it to me. And you know what the majority of the world says? I don't want that. I've got mine. And that's called self-righteousness. And it's called religion. And I've got it together. And respect me. And this is how I feel. And this is what I think. And God says that'll never work. Except the free gift from Jesus. The resource, the resurrection, the righteousness. And proud man. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Proud man is so stuffed full of himself, rejecting the perfection of God's supplied Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know where you're at today, but let me say this. God created you. He loves you. He wants to meet with you. He wants to work in your heart. He wants to do great things. Don't sit in your own pride Don't reject what God wants and what he wants to do. Submit to him. Let Christ be your resource. Let Christ be the resurrection. That is the lifeblood of however many years you have. And let Christ, the Messiah, be your righteousness. Don't try to be your own righteousness. You know, when the Soviet Union fell, There were many, many orphans. And there was different groups that came and rescued these sometimes very young kids, sometimes older kids, and they brought them in, and and they had great buildings and all kinds of great resources. But the problem really wasn't so much physical, but it was emotional. It was internal. and, And these young orphans just struggled with doubt and fears, and and phobias too, but fears. And they couldn't get the kids to sleep. They wouldn't sleep. And so they were deprived of sleep. They were anxious and they were nervous and they were sickly. and They wouldn't sleep. They were so fearful that everything would be gone in the morning. Maybe everything today was great, but I can't sleep because I'll wake up tomorrow and it will be gone. But then somebody came up with an idea. And what they did is they, they would tuck all the kids in bed Come say something to them. Touch them. Say it's going to be okay. And they would put a piece of bread in their hand. And they'd say, don't eat it. This is for tomorrow. You hold on to that bread. Probably got a little bit mangled up, but you hold on to that bread. And when you wake up in the morning, that's your breakfast. And you know what those kids did? They fell asleep, and they trusted, and they had hope. Now, this room is filled with people that have had their hearts broken, their dreams shattered. Shame seems to slip in and creep in. We distract ourselves with this, that, and the other thing, running here and there. We feel insufficient. We wonder. Will God supply? Can God satisfy the needs of my life? Is He the resource? Is God truly the resurrection, the life for me? Is He righteous? Is He holy? Is He enough for me? And I want to say, without a quiver in my voice, I know my Redeemer liveth. I know that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is everything He claims to be and more. And you are wise to trust Him. Trust Him completely with all of your life, with all of your heart. If you're wondering what you should do, 
Now let me give you some advice. Trust God. Trust Him. He's everything He claims, claims to be and more. I am the bread of life.